Let me see. Okay, good morning, everybody. Hope you guys are still awake. Um, there's more coffee next door if you need it. Uh, my name is Jim Maricondo, and I work for Consensus on the Global Business Development Solutions Team. I'm not sure if you've heard of Consensus. We're a venture production studio founded by Joseph Lubin, one of the creators of Ethereum, and our mission is to spread blockchain and decentralized technologies into as much of the world as possible. Everything from government to enterprise, um, education, pretty much you name it. And so I appreciate being given the opportunity to moderate the panel today. We've got a couple distinguished VCs here. Um, I've got a few topics which I um, want to discuss. Um, but before we do that, maybe I could have a brief poll. Um, I'd appreciate it if you could raise your hand in the audience if you identify yourself as an investor. You can define investor, but a few of them. Um, who, who actually has invested in an ICO? Um, all right, and keep your hands raised if you're actually an accredited investor. Just, just wondering. <laughs> um, okay, still, still a, a, a good overlap with those regions. Okay, so uh, we're kind of down to a bit of a smaller panel right now, but I'd like to start with maybe um, a brief intro, and maybe you could answer just how long you've been investing in, in blockchain startups. Um, please go ahead. Sure. Hi, I'm Bernard Moon. I'm co-founder of uh, Spark Labs Group. We're a network of accelerators in Asia, and then we also have uh, a few venture capital funds. I'm more full-time on our global seed stage fund called Spark Labs Global. Uh, we recently launched uh, Spark Chain, which is a blockchain-focused fund. Uh, that's led by Joyce Kim, the co-founder of Stellar. Uh, so I'm the one with the lesser experience. Uh, we've been investing in this space since 2014. Our first investment was in a company out of Stockholm called Cryx, which was a F F FX cryptocurrency exchange. And then um, also out of our accelerator in Seoul, uh, we invested in a company called Blocko in 2015, which is now the leading enterprise blockchain company in Korea. And also Senpi in 2015, which is the leading Bitcoin remittance company in, in South Korea. And then recently out of our uh, global seed fund, we invested in Masari, which is trying to be sort of a crunch base slash Edgar online in the crypto space. Uh, Gamma, which is uh, crypto mining slash online gaming play, uh, and then a couple others. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jay Um. I'm a co-founder and managing director of Translink Capital based in Palo Alto. It's too bad uh, our fellow panelists couldn't join us today because I think our preference would be to have a more diverse perspective. Bernard and I are really close friends, and we do a lot of work together in Korea, so you'll only see a little bit of a bias there. Uh, but my day job, uh, I've been on the venture capital side for about 18 years. Um, uh, I started my career at a firm called Vertex uh, Management, which is the venture capital arm of the Singapore headquarter Tomasic Group. And we were fund investors in all the top funds uh, from Sequoia and about the remaining 40 or so from there. And we would invest in later stage opportunities uh, to help the companies expand internationally. Uh, while I was doing that, I was recruited by Samsung in 2003 to start and lead Samsung Ventures here in the US. Um, and then in 2007, I left Samsung to start TransLink with a couple of very close friends who had also been on the corporate side, uh, one a Japanese gentleman, another a Taiwanese gentleman. And collectively, uh, we used to represent firms like SoftBank, Foxconn, Samsung, etc. And what we do is we connect US-based innovative startup companies to their customers and partners in Asia, specifically across Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and China. And we work closely with the larger technology companies out there. Uh, my involvement on the blockchain side uh, happened uh, in 2013 when one of the entrepreneurs that I had a relationship with uh, connected, uh, approached me with an interesting business plan to connect Korea to the Bitcoin world. And that was a company called Corbit, that was the first crypto exchange in Korea. And for those, obviously, who follow uh, the crypto market, um, Korea has been a huge market for uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, about a third of the households nationally have trading accounts. The trading volume on a daily basis has exceeded the regular stock market equivalent uh, on the trades. And so the government had to intervene and so on. Um, 
so as part of that investment in Corbett, I've been involved in a number of ICOs of the past uh, nine months or so, um, ranging from uh, Korea-based uh, projects like Icon and more locally-based projects like uh, B Token, mm -hmm. Referium, and then also have uh, invested in some more global ambitious projects like Telegram and just had some exposure on that side um, to be able to kind of compare and contrast with traditional venture funding and ICOs. Great, thanks a lot. Um, so, you know, we, we've seen uh, an explosion in, in ICOs and tokens these days. How, would, how do you guys evaluate a good opportunity? And maybe you could take it both from the perspective of a VC as well as uh, like an, a, an individual ICO investor. Um. Well, I'm probably in the minority. I, I think we as a firm have been very sort of conservative within this space and approach, even uh, on our Spark chain side. I, I think we've been sort of saying publicly since last summer that uh, eventually utility tokens has to be tied to equity in some form or manner. And I think we've seen that movement since, even though it's taken a while. Uh, we've seen it also first in, since we have footprint in China, Korea, Japan, we saw those regulatory bodies move first, and then now the US. So when we look at an ICO, I think it's almost like a, you know, we will consider it. Uh, and some of our partners have done it more personally. Uh, but as a firm, we sort of see it as a double home run. Like it's hard enough to launch our startup product. Then second, it's hard enough to, uh, you know, build the ecosystem around it. So we're definitely the minority, I think, in this space. Um, so I think, again, this is why it would have been helpful to have a more diverse <laughs> panel. Uh, I think our perspectives um, are very similar to Bernard's. Um, if you really think about it, uh, while there's a lot of excitement around ICOs, it really is a financing event. And the financing event, as we all know, is the beginning of the process to actually deliver a product or a platform or a service and then market that product platform service, generate revenue, and create value. And the reality is uh, not a lot of teams, quite frankly, are necessarily built out to complete that entire process. There does seem to be um, a trend where some of uh, the ICOs, not all of them, but some of the ICOs, uh, have a little bit more of a short-term perspective. Let's get the money first, and we'll figure out things later. And, and those are the projects that I think um, have the risk to run into trouble uh, because if they don't necessarily have the right team from an engineering or technical background, nor necessarily the business experience to expand that and build out their business on that, then a lot of these ICO proceeds will be churned in and wasted. And I think we've all heard stories about you know, waste and fraud and whatnot with the ICO proceeds. Um, and so those are the type of projects we tend to avoid, or at least try to. And at the end of the day, what we're really looking for is a combination of things that, as venture capitalists, we look for in equity investments. We're looking for an experienced, solid team that are going after a large opportunity in a space that they're familiar with and have proven the capability to execute on that. And while the ICO bubble seems to be somewhat bursting with the support of Nadia and the SEC early on. Um, I do think that the back to the basics principle is happening right now. Uh, you'll see experienced entrepreneurs evaluating the possibility, the pros and cons of an ICO versus an equity raise. And some of them have decided to move away from the ICO track back to an equity raise. Others are already pursued, uh, pursue, proceeding with that but they're doing it in a much more measured, de deliberate, careful way to make sure that everything is legit and focusing really on knowledgeable, accredited investors that could potentially add value, which is again very similar to how startups raise venture capital anyway. Yeah, I just realized that our comments might not be helpful for 
for those of you that are obviously actively looking at ICOs, I'll just sort of add a little more color to it. I mean, if I were to look at an ICO and invest in, I would do it sort of the same way as any seed stage investor does it. I would not invest in a company that just has a white paper, no product. I mean, unless they are a successful sort of repeat entrepreneur with a track record. Um, if they're not, and they don't have that background, then definitely dive into the product and look at the traction that they have. And you could just search online and see sort of regular comps. Like, even at the seed stage, a lot of you know, e-commerce startups might not even get seed funding, funding from investors unless they have like, you know, at least like half million in, in revenue organically. I mean, there's certain benchmarks that you guys could look at just like any other seed stage investor would. I would just do that and, and, and be smart about your investments. Um, yeah, thanks a lot, Bernard and Jay. Uh, just to summarize a bit, yeah, personally, you know, we, what I think is we've seen this uh, now effect of having instant liquidity. Um, you know, the tokens become tradable in most cases right after the ICO, but maybe like, like our panelists said, they don't even have a product yet or have they even had experience delivering a product? And then how do you value or how does the market value a token that's tradable that doesn't have a product and then you get all this craziness? And so I think, you know, we're going to start to see those types of projects get less momentum and have a harder time raising funds. And so, you know, as individual investors too, you know, it's good to look for that and try to invest in projects that maybe already have an alpha or they're close to having an alpha or they have a seasoned team. But, you know, it's, but I think it's an interesting evolution on, on the VC model where, you know, now you don't have to wait three years or 10 years for your liquidity event. Yeah, you might, you can, you can get out in and out um, quicker. Do, do you guys actually invest in tokens or still just in equity in your, in your funds? Yeah, uh, we, we just mainly invest in equity. Um, like I said, we'll, we'll look at some ICOs and consider it, but... Um, I think okay. for most sort of early stage seed Series A investors, I mean, even though there's, you'll see these posts and hype, oh, it's, you know, ICOs are going to disrupt venture capital. Um, we're not really concerned at all. You know, we think it's more complementary at the B and C stage. A, a great example is Y Combinator. You look at it, you know, they invest 120, 120,000 into these startups, ask, get six, seven percent. And a lot of these companies, they've already raised like one to five million. So the best entrepreneurs will still raise money at the seed and early stage from smart investors that could add value. And then, you know, maybe at the B or C round, uh, they'll go the ICO route, which the window is lessening, but, you know, at least I personally believe the ICO uh, channel for fundraising is here to stay. I just don't think it'll be at this typical seed stage where some companies could raise five to 10 million on average on a white paper. I think it's gonna shift to sort of mid-stage investment. Um. Yeah, I think um, it remains to be seen how successful these ICO projects are ultimately gonna be. Um, as we all know, uh, a lot of these ICOs have popped, um, you know, to crazy amounts. In fact, you know, there was some conversation, I believe it was uh, late last year, where when some of these tokens were appreciating 10, 20, 50x uh, in a matter of a month or two, right? And if you think about venture, how venture capital works, it takes, you know, typically at least five to seven years for an exit event to happen and if you actually get a 10x, that's considered a really good outcome. So yes, there was conversation around that. But again, you have to remember, it's not the multiple that you hold while you're still gambling in the casino that counts. It's the amount that we, when you actually leave the casino that really matters. And so while a lot of these tokens have appreciated, we all know in the past three months, they've crashed down to earth again. So if you really think about it, from a longer term perspective, again, the best way in our opinion to consider an ICO event is a financing event. And if you think about the options to an entrepreneur, it could be debt financing, which was the original traditional way to build companies. You'd get a loan from friends, family, or if you're lucky, get it from a bank, mortgage your house, start a company and build it, and then venture capital emerged from that. And then in the past decade, there's been 
the evolution further where you have crowdfunding availability through AngelList and other seed funds. You have crowdfunding ability through Kickstarter or Indiegogo for certain projects. And now you have ICOs as another means of crowdfunding. And all of these options, I think, are healthy for the entrepreneur to consider. Again, there's pros and cons. But at the end of the day, the financing event is not the goal. It's just the beginning. And ultimately, you have to create value and deliver on that value to get to the outcome that we're looking for. And so while many people are worried, and it's been brought up, ICOs versus venture capital, venture capital traditionally, at least we make an effort to add value in company building to get to that outcome that you need. And so I wouldn't say it's any adversarial uh, zero-sum game. Whatever the initial funding comes from, if the company needs to continue to grow and expand, then venture capital will still have a role to play. And we are seeing projects. I mean, I think everybody knows that uh, Y Combinator Demo Day is happening. There are a number of projects in that demo day that had raised successful ICOs to the, to the tone of 20, 30 million dollars that are actually raising equity seed rounds to get value added investors that can help them hire the right people, get to the right customers, and build their business so they can actually realize the original vision that they set out themselves for. So again, I think it's very complementary in many ways. I mean, assuming what I said is, is correct, is that uh, the ICO market will sort of shift to the mid-stage. I think actually that's better for the regular sort of retail individual investors. Because when you invest in at the series sort of B or C, a lot of risk is taken out, but you still get great returns, right? If you think about it, a lot of risk is out. And, you know, Look at the Dropboxes, Twitters, or you know Square. I mean, Dropbox will go public soon. I think you guys, you know, if you invested at the B round, you're you're sitting pretty right now. Um, and a practical thing, if you, I would look at um, when you look at an ICO, I would look at certain numbers in terms of also what the founders uh, retain for themselves versus the company. Because I just recently came across and heard about a company that raised 30 million last year on the ICO, they just burned through everything already and they shut down. <laughs> but one signal was, and, and it, if I looked at it, like uh, I remember the founders allocated, I forgot, something like 15, 20% to themselves, right? So they're definitely looking out for themselves versus the company. So those are numbers that I would look and ask for. I mean, it has to be much smaller than that, or all to the company. I mean, that, it just, those are just signals that you could look out for. Was that in the white paper, the, the <laughs> no, allocation? Yeah. Of course it's not in the white yeah, paper, so see. you have to push an end. I mean, as an investor, <laughs> they tell us, but then the individuals, they don't. So that's something to really ask in the Telegram forums or whatever. <laughs> right, right, you got to I, I think dig for the that. other phenomenon that I think um, most of us are aware of, you know, there clearly is now a spectrum of quality in terms of ICOs today. There was a time that the rising tide raised all ICOs, and any ICO was popping, right? Those times are gone now, and I, I really don't think they're gonna come back, in my opinion. And if you look at the ICOs that are out there today, I frankly believe many of them, a lot of the individual investors that are in this room may not have even heard of, because they're actually not gonna do open crowd sales. They're actually going to private sales for their pre-sale, they're talking to investors with a lot of experience that can help them. And the phenomenon is a lot of venture capital firms, I can tell you for sure, are looking to talk to their limited partners and investors to have the ability to participate in token sales as well, if it makes sense. And I would say, you know, out of seven or eight firms, out of every 10 firms on up and down in Sand Hill and Silicon Valley, everybody now has that clause in their limited partnership agreement to be able to do those token sales. And I think everybody's read the announcements that Telegram, you had some big name firms, including Benchmark and Sequoia and others participate. So the quality ICOs are actually going to the same quality investors. And the opportunity for an individual investor to actually get participation in an ICO is gonna be, a quality ICO is gonna be limited. So the question that you have to ask yourself if you're an individual investor that doesn't necessarily have a lot of investment experience or a value add angle, you have to ask yourself, why is this ICO coming to me? Why am I having this opportunity to invest? 
And maybe you should scrutinize more of whether or not this is actually going to be a good investment opportunity or not. Right. That, that's some really great advice. Um, I, I like the point you made, um, Jay, about uh, the Y Combinator companies uh, going for um, both an ICO to get funding and then going back for, for equity for advisors. And I don't know, I'd like to use that maybe just to talk a little bit about the subject of tokens. And so, you know, that the, what is a token? Um, well, a token, you know, besides being a security or utility, you know, it, it, it could be used for in different ways. I, I could say one way of looking at it might be, you know, the tokens is incentivizing the community. You know, you're trying to get people as like almost like a co, in some cases it's like a co-op ownership where they either, you know, they, they own a share of the company or they, they're excited about your company, they, they become your fans. But yeah, those aren't the same people necessarily who are going to, you know, advise your business deals. So this idea of, you know, getting, you know, advice from equity advisors on the business side, but also, you know, designing a token and, and distributing it among people who are going to be using your platform or advocating for your platform, that seems like a, a winning combination. Um, I mean, a absolutely. And so there are platforms that, because in the nature of the business they're trying to build, is naturally distributed. I think a good example of that is uh, a project called Referium. Uh, and for those that are familiar with for a referium, I think they'll understand, but if you think about the way that, let's say, digital content, or specifically games, uh, become successful, there is a tremendous amount of viral effect that happens to happen uh, on top of the marketing spend that you have. And the marketing channels, as we know, for any indie developer in this day and age, and this is timely because we're in GDC week this week, is exorbitantly expensive the acquisition cost for an install is anywhere from three to five dollars if you're really good at it. And if not, it's very, very expensive. The phenomenon, on the other hand, for influencer marketing, where you have YouTube stars and influencers basically promote certain apps, services, and games, even those have become really expensive to do. But at the same time, the success of any single application or game is dependent on the grassroots word of mouth. And those folks get no credit and no benefit. So the way that the referring token is designed is to actually give those folks an opportunity to participate and get an incentive and some payoff in terms of the tokens that hopefully will appreciate with more usage. So the more tokens that are distributed out there, the better for them. And so they purposely will have a public sale to enable that. But even for them, quite frankly, the pri private sale was so successful that the portion that's going into the public sale is still very limited. So again, it depends on the opportunity, but the quality projects are going to private sale only, and the public sale portions are going to be very, very limited going forward. Thanks. Um, so do you, guys, I mean, do you have, uh, Jay and, and Bernard here, do you guys have any personal preference on, you know, what, are, what the most, I don't know, your, your favorite types of projects to fund. You know, some people say they like to focus on infrastructure, you know, say platforms or protocols or infrastructure. You know, we're starting to see the, the first batch of distributed applications, although, you know, those are still less proven. But um, do, do you, is it pretty much all over, or do you guys focus on certain areas of projects? I mean, I can go. I, I will tell you that my token portfolio is relatively diverse, uh, both domestic, international, both infrastructure as well as application areas. Um, I think everybody in the room will agree that because it's still early days, the issues around the blockchain in terms of scalability, security are still massive, and they need to be fixed. Now, the good news is there's a lot of projects that are working on aspects to fix those problems, and so naturally, infrastructure plays are going to make sense. Um, the challenge is, again, the ones, I don't think it's a necessarily a matter of which area is going to be more successful than the other. There's going to be quality projects on the infrastructure side, and there's going to be not so interesting projects or not good projects on that side. And the same in terms of the distributed app side as well. Some projects could be very successful, and others will not be. Um, so for me, I'm not looking necessarily at a category and just investing in all the infrastructure projects that are out there. I'm trying to be discerning among the infrastructure projects, which has, again, the quality teams, the ability to deliver on these infrastructure promises. Because the theoretical holes that are out there in the infrastructure today is very widely known. But to actually fix them is very difficult, 
right? And so it requires a high level of experienced teams to actually focus on that problem and fix that. And so if you find that th those teams are out there and you get an opportunity to involve, I think those are interesting. And on the same side with you know, distributed apps as well, the same thing. There's going to be quality projects, frankly, very few quality projects in my opinion, and there's going to be a lot of not so interesting ones that you want to avoid. Yeah, so our approach, it really depends on by geography. So in the US, we look at more within ecosystem plays um, for new protocols. It could be new exchanges, new sort of consumer apps, um, even new sort of financing instruments. Uh, we invest in a company called Dharma that came out of, it was like the hot crypto uh, startup out of YC last year. Their new play on uh, venture debt. Uh, in Asia, we see a little differently. Uh, I would sort of we see either new technology plays uh, or new sort of enterprise, enterprise plays that come, uh, come out of Asia. Example is Blocko, the company I mentioned, they're the leading enterprise company in Korea. So they already have signed up like Hyundai Motors, Samsung Card, actually a credit card company that's using it on the back end, Korea Exchange, which is a traditional uh, financial trading platform. And Korea Exchange just came out with a report last year that uh, Blocko saved them $73 million on the back end. So you see a lot of that stuff going on in Asia. There's another company in China that we're well aware of that uses blockchain uh, technology on the enterprise side. And they also, it's a large company, and they said it saved them over $300 million. So you see that type of sort of progress in Asia, but we think eventually it'll come to the U.S., where the B of A's and Chase's and... Humana's will eventually get over their pilots and there'll be sort of real strong enterprise players uh, within the US market. Uh, the consumer side, we're sort of waiting because there's, you know, scale. Oh, okay, okay. There's, you know, scalability issues on the, on the public chain, but on the private chain, you know, we haven't really seen any issues on that front. We're going to now have time for five minutes, so questions. Also, I did find out the other two speakers were unfortunately delayed on plane, so they're unable to make it today. Um, but we can now take questions, and if you have a question, raise your hand. Isabel here will bring you a mic so we can hear you. Okay, so just raise your hand. Thank you. Hi. Uh, you had mentioned earlier that uh, equity and commodities were making sense to tie into the token economy, and I just was curious which ones that you see have the most promised in uh, this kind of setup, like uh, not just you know, what tokens are being successful, but what kind of um, connection to, like, certain things. I saw something that was, like, banana coin <laughs> that was tied to, like, plantains, and I'm seeing more and more and more of those things tied to gold. Um, I know we had somebody from the SEC just talk about diamonds and that being kind of fraudulent, but... Um, I am seeing more. Are you asking us to make token recommendations? No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm asking uh, what commodities make sense in uh, kind of this incredibly volatile space. What commodities make sense? Correct. Correct. Yeah. Are you talking about gold, oil, natural resource yes. commodities? Yes. Wow, that's a, that's a tough question. I, I don't have a good answer <laughs> for that. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's, uh, no, that's, that's okay. One that's if you well don't be on my pay grade, so. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Could you say two words about? how incentives of venture capital firms change when they invest in a startup through tokens rather than through equity. Just to explain as a background, in the classic model, as you already underlined, the venture capital firm would invest in the people uh, more often than in their business plan because they believe in the people. Um, while is it true what I heard anecdotally that the venture capital firms today negotiate more on the exit plan for the tokens, how quickly they can sell the tokens on an exchange rather than on changes to the business plan and to the management team? No, so, so I, I think I can answer that. So uh, any experienced venture capitalist uh, knows this, where you invest in private companies, startup stages, right? And let's say the company was massively successful and the company goes public. You're not selling all the equity in that 
that company overnight because you're going to destroy value by dumping shares on the exchange, in this case, NASDAQ, right? So you, you typically will do two things. One is you're continuously trying to create value for those startup companies by continuously supporting hiring, strategic decisions, customer introductions, and whatnot to make sure the value of the enterprise continues to grow. And while it continues to grow because it's already a public company, you will have opportunities to skim off the top and create an exit plan where typically on a quarterly basis alongside with the management team that you will have exit windows where it's a very orderly sale. It's pre-announced to everybody so that there's no surprises to the analyst. There's no shock of founders and investors selling. And so that's managed in a, in a way that is very well documented and very um, prevalent. Now, the, the way that a lot of venture capitalists think about ICOs is exactly the same thing. The only difference is, instead of waiting for five to seven years and the company has revenue, customers, and whatnot, they're doing it at a very early stage. But they're not investing for the short-term pop. That wouldn't make sense. It's not a good use of capital. And their skill set and training does not, is not conducive to that. So what they're trying to do by participating in ICOs is basically to help that project to continue to grow in value. And so at some point, with the liquidity, they can actually start selling some of those tokens in an orderly way so that they can generate a return on their initial investment. Great. Well, thank you. Let's give a round of applause to our investor panel. Thank you so much.